discuss the Green Party's response to austerity. And it's actually very, very simple. No thank you, we don't want it. Because, <laughs> because actually austerity is not an economic imperative. Austerity has nothing to do with the crash. No matter how often our Chancellor and his colleagues repeat that particular lie, it is completely a political decision. And like any political decision, there are alternatives to it. And as most of us are actually aware, the financial crisis in 2008 was an absolute gift to the Tory party. It enabled them to scare people into voting them back into power or at least almost back into power. And since then, it's given them the excuse they wanted to shrink the state, to cut social security system to the bone, and of course, whichever of the four neoliberal parties get into power next time, that is set to continue and get worse. And it isn't actually working by the criteria they set themselves. They said we needed to cut the deficit, and the debt, and we're actually borrowing more now than when we were when the coalition was formed. The public sector net borrowing for April to July of this year was £32.4 billion. And when you're talking about those figures, it's fairly meaningless. But that's £9.4 billion pounds more than it was last year. 32.4 billion this year, which is 9.4 billion more than it was last year. So it's not happening. We're not reducing our debt. And they tell us, of course, how wonderful it is that employment, unemployment, is down to just over 2 million. <laughs> which is still a disgrace. And of course, the huge cause very often by the huge number of people who are suffering the sanctions that the social security departments are giving out and people living from hand to mouth or being self-employed with an income well well below the living wage and that of course gives a lie to the statement that we are in recovery because a higher GDP does not mean a better standard of living for most working people all it means is that some rich people are spending more on posher yachts. And they said they wanted us to realise we're all in this together. But at every budget, every time they've announced things, it's been cuts to services, social security payments, wages, assistance for children, working people and the infirm. And they've announced that they're using that money taken from the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society. And of course the hardest working. And they're spending it on tax cuts, especially for the richest and richest people and for big businesses. The amount of tax cuts big businesses have had over the last few years has been incredible. <coughs> But of course, in this they're ably abetted by the Lib Dems, and the vast majority of the national media too have taken their side. And even the Labour Party's announcements have just sounded like promises to wear slightly softer shoes while they keep the poor and migrants. But we can show them how to arrest this crisis. We have to make sure we tax people properly. That's ensure that people pay the correct amount of tax, the legal level and the level they're expected to pay. Tax evasion and tax avoidance cost us, according to economists, £120 billion pounds a year. Plenty to solve our debt crisis. Let's make sure that we set taxes that aren't there to be avoided, because they are at the moment, and that when people evade them illegally, we catch them and we punish them. We don't say to them, well, if you pay 10% of the tax you actually owe, we'd be very grateful. Would you mind doing that, please? We need to punish them. And of course, we need to cut some things. We need to cut the replacement for Trident. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a weapon 
payment system we don't need and which will cost us more than hundred billion pounds over its lifetime. And the Scots wouldn't have had it if they'd got independent with had it. Really had to look at what ha was happening, but sadly not now. And we introduced a land value tax to stop speculators just making money for nothing. <coughs> <to> <coughs> And a Robin Hood tax to take some of the money back from the bankers who took it off us in the first place. And how about a wealth tax so that everything over three million pounds in assets is actually subject to taxation at a very small rate but still taxation. And we could even work on making the banks themselves pay some of the money we lent them rather than coming up with half-baked deals to sell the stakes in them to oil billionaires in other countries. Now, of course, with all this extra income, what you should be thinking of is, well, how can we possibly spend all that money we'd raise? <laughs> well, we have a few ideas. One thing we could do is repay some of our debt, but in the right way, not just blankly. We on the moderate left in the Green Party think that we should pay pension fund debts to ensure that people who've worked all their lives can enjoy a comfortable retirement. But we should, re we should ensure that that is our debt repayment priority. <coughs> we still haven't had a proper debt audit to find out to whom we owe all this money. And I don't think we should feel any compunction whatsoever to pay money out to hedge funds and Russian oligarchs. They've got enough. They don't need that. Another thing we could do is work on schemes to improve infrastructure. And I mean actual infrastructure that we need for local people. Obviously here in Oxford it is vital to improve the transport infrastructure not spend billions on HS2, which is actually just designed to make Birmingham a commuter town for London. And we can bring people back into the world of work by doing this, which of course benefits everyone. They get a job and a decent income. The taxpayer spends less on social security payments. And everyone benefits from the results of their labour. It will enable us to create energy efficient, well insulated homes if we have this money. Homes fit the 21st, se uh, 21st century developed state. And again, it will also offer people employment and at a decent rate, cutting even further our welfare costs. And no one loses. And like the coalition scheme, in which we pay £75 a fortnight for people to work in shops, leaving the shops to lay off staff who they would actually have to pay themselves if it wasn't for the workfare schemes. And of course, that when they're let, laid off, it leads to more people being forced to rely on social security, leaving us to pay more in benefits, meaning the only winners are the shareholders in these big retail businesses. Under our plan, of course, don't get free labour for nothing from the taxpayer. Under our plan, everyone actually wins, except, of course, maybe the rich capitalists. And if, if you're beginning to think, well, is there really enough money to go around to do all this? You only have to think of recent announcement. Last week, I think it was, one of the big supermarket companies announced the, the disastrous news that their profits have gone down to only £239 million pounds in six months. <laughs> this was a disaster. Share prices plummeted. Um, but, uh, why do these big businesses have to pay tax now at, at a lower rate than I do? It's wrong. We can do something about it. Of course, while we're on the subject of work and pay, we must ensure that we pay people a decent living wage. In the Green Party, we think a minimum of £10 an hour to be brought in by 2020, 
seems a reasonable idea. Until, of course, we reach the point where we can introduce a universal income. One of my pet hobby horses. Um, now, working tax credits and income support are bad policies. But they're not just bad policies because they burden us all as taxpayers. They're bad policies because they're a clear acceptance of the fact that private businesses are refusing to pay their employees enough money to live on. They are actually a totally unacceptable form of corporate welfare. We have to insist that employees are paid a decent wage for their hard work. That wage must never be less than they require to live on. If you meet people who don't have the heart for a discussion on fairness, remind them that this policy is good because it reduces the amount we have to pay out as taxpayers. But for you and I, we think you should get a living wage for a decent day's work. Now, to get out of the crisis, we must invest Invest in jobs, in jobs in useful industries and in people. And in case anyone from the coalition didn't stumble in in the last few people coming in, there's one area of industry in particular that can help us out here. We believe green technology holds the key to rescuing us from ecological catastrophe. Species extinction, rising temperatures and sea levels do threaten us all. And of course, we must act, and act fast, to stop it in its tracks. Earlier in the year, we've seen carbon dioxide levels reach 400 parts per million for the first time since humans have been walking on this planet. But it hardly made a ripple in the media, because there's no profit for big businesses in that. And the beauty of green technology, of the green economy, is that it also offers us a path out of the economic crisis at the same, fit, at the same time. It's a little mentioned fact that in 2011, before the coalition crushed it with its green crap rhetoric and promises to frack, the UK's green economy delivered a third of all the economic growth in the country. We can lead the world in green technology and manufacture, creating thousands and thousands of new jobs in the process, if we're just brave enough to do it. It'll take investment, but if our politicians don't believe that people and the planet are worth investing in, then we've got to change our politicians. There is an alternative to austerity, we need to shout it from the rooftops, from the platforms, and the, from the barricades. The answer is austerity, no thank you.